Good evening and welcome to St Thomas Baptist Church this evening. I'm Stephen, I'm the senior pastor and it's lovely to welcome you again to worship. For those who join with us on a weekly basis, um, it's just wonderful. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for tuning in week by week and um, being able to study God's word together. We're not in person, um, but the point is we have the person of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit meeting with us in our homes, wherever we're watching and and showing us and revealing to us his word. I want to thank those who have helped us preach through this series and tonight I want to thank Gary Curran who's going to lead us in our study in Isaiah 57. How the God in the person of Jesus comes to revive the spirit of the lowly and um, how he, we see Jesus as we continue this series, see Jesus in Isaiah. And can I encourage you just to constantly go back and read this whole portion for us um, chapter 40 to chapter 40 to chapter 66 has been called the New Testament um, enveloped in the old and Isaiah has just been given this wonderful vision of what the servant king the servant messiah would come and do for us and as we said the other week we have the privilege of looking back through the lens of Calvary and it just gives us a clearer and a more beautiful and a more rounded view of who Jesus is and um, I trust as we, as we see the person of Jesus, it encourages our hearts. It helps us to fall more in love with him. It helps us to appreciate all that he's done for us and what he's made us. He's made us his children. He's made us heirs with his father. And, um, and we're just so grateful for God's grace and God's love and for God's mercy. So in a moment or two, Holly is going to read to us from God's word from that passage that Gary's going to preach on and then Gary's going to open up God's word to us this evening. And as we study, our prayer is simple. Lord, help us to see Jesus. So let's pray as we seek God for tonight's message and for tonight's service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. Not that we loved you, first loved you, but you first loved us. And you gave your son uh, as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And Lord, we want to thank you for the beauty of, that we see in Jesus. We want to thank you for all that we've been able to learn of, of, of your son through the Old Testament. How those wonderful pictures were just wonderfully painted so that we would appreciate your son in all his splendour and all his glory. And he is the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. And tonight we would pray that that's, you would become even more precious to us that we would, we would love you more, we would cherish you more, we would worship you and adore you as we really should. We pray for everyone who's watching this evening. We pray that you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know our homes, you know the world in which we're living in, the, the, the distresses that, that we face, the, the pressures that we're under. But Lord, we want to thank you that we can rest in your promises, we can lean on the person of your son, Jesus Christ. We can know the power of your Holy Spirit working in our hearts and lives. And we pray as your word is open to us tonight, would you open us to your word? Not that our heads would be filled with a greater knowledge, but our hearts might be transformed into a greater likeness of Jesus. And we just ask that you'll bless Gary um, as he has preached your word. Lord, just... And bless him for his faithfulness to you. And Lord, help us all um, in these days of great trials. Help us to lean and to focus and to keep our attention on the author, on the finisher, on the perfecter of our most holy faith. So Lord, we ask for your help. We ask for your presence. We ask for your power. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Holly's going to read to us from God's word, then Gary is going to share God's word. The Lord bless you. Isaiah 57, verses 12 to 21. Now I will expose your so-called good deeds. None of them will help you. Let's see if your idols can save you when you cry to them for help. Why, a puff of wind can knock them down. If you just breathe on them, they will fall over. But whoever trusts in me will inherit the land and possess my holy mountain. God says, rebuild the road, clear away the rocks and stones, 
so people can return from captivity. The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. For I will not fight against you forever. I will not always be angry. If I were, all people would pass away, all the souls I have made. I was angry, so I punished these greedy people. I withdrew them from them, but they kept going on their own stubborn way. I have seen what they do, but I will heal them anyway. I will lead them. I will comfort those who mourn, bring words of praise to their lips. May they have abundant peace, both near and far, says the Lord who heals them. But those who still reject me are like the restless sea, which is never still but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says my God. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my thanks this evening go out to Stephen for his introduction of this evening's service and also to Holly for reading our scripture uh, this evening that we're going to be studying. Uh, my thanks also go out to you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in as we go through uh, our series of seeing Jesus in Isaiah. So tonight we're going to be looking at Isaiah 57 verses 12 to 21 as we bring this series of seeing Jesus in Isaiah to its end. So please have your Bibles ready, have them open and follow as we go. But before we do, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Um, Lord, we trust that you are with us uh, wherever we are, in our own homes or wherever we're watching this uh, this evening. Please use this evening to encourage us, but also to challenge us in our walk with Jesus, in our view of who you are. Lord, let it be an opportunity for us to um, really, really uh, question where we're at in relation to you. And Lord, use this to, to bring us closer um, and to help us to be more like Jesus in our daily lives. So Lord, let it be your words which are spoken tonight. Um, and let it really have an impact in our lives, we pray. Lord, we just give this evening over to you now. In Jesus' name, for his glory we pray. Amen. So, here we go. Let's see Jesus in Isaiah 57. Now, previously in chapter 57, leading up to the scripture that we're going to be looking at this evening, <clears throat> there's an awful lot of description, a vivid description, uh, in sin and idol worshipping. So, I ask the question, what is an idol in our lives? And I think the answer is quite simple. Anything that stops God being the most important in our lives. A good test is when we're in need, who do we turn to first for help? Is it our Lord or is it man? Do we turn to ourselves? And we just trust in ourselves and think that we can sort things out? Is it our friends? Is it our family? Is it work colleagues? Or indeed, do we even turn to world leaders for answers and for help? All of which can be a help. But is it our Lord that we turn to first? An elderly man was living alone and wanted to plant his annual tomato garden. But it was really difficult hard work because the ground was dry and because he was old. His only son, who would normally have helped him to do this, was in prison. But the old man turned to his son for help and wrote him a letter describing the predicament he was in. And it went something like this. Dear Paul, I am feeling sad as I won't be able to plant my tomato garden this year. I'm getting too old to dig up the plot. I know if you were here, my troubles would be over. I know you would be happy to dig the plot for me, like the old days. Love, Dad. 
A few days later, the man received a letter from his son. It was brief and to the point. Dear Dad, don't dig up that garden. That's where the bodies are buried. Love, Paul. By 4am the next morning, CID and a load of other police officers arrived at the house and dug up the entire area without finding any bodies. They apologised to the elderly man and went on their way. The same day, the elderly man received another letter from his son. And it said, Dear Dad, go ahead and plant the tomatoes now. That's the best I could do under the circumstances. Now I'm sure you knew that's where that was going. It's not one of mine, it was sent to me. But just asks the question, doesn't it? Who do we turn to in times of need? Looking at our present day, the UK at the moment, along with the, most of the rest of the world, are going through the uh, effects of coronavirus. The UK is also uh, looking at the coming towards the conclusion of trying to do a deal with the EU as we look to leave properly in Brexit uh, in a couple of months or in a month's time. And we also have the issue, don't we, who's going to be the next Amer American president for the next four years? If we worship and put our trust and faith in world leaders and not God, we mustn't be surprised if God gives us what we desire and allows us to further suffer the consequences. Verse 6 here in chapter 57 says, They, not I, are your inheritance. Now, there's a sharp contrast from the first portion of chapter 57 and what we are looking at tonight. The first section, verses 3 to 11, as I've said, a really quite vivid description of where they were at, but it basically boils down to the failings of humans, the inability to live righteous lives. You, your and yours are used 28 times between verses 3 and 11. Now, between verses 12 and 21, the focus is on what God will do for his people that they cannot do for themselves. So the words I, me, myself and my are mentioned 19 times. We need to remember that Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ. That it is God's plan for Israel and is a prophecy. It was at the time of writing for the now and for the future. 700 years before the prophecy was to be fulfilled. When it was written, as we heard last week, Isaiah and Israel had a time of hope, a time of waiting on God for the fulfilment of the Messiah, the Saviour's coming. We are blessed in that we can look back through the cross and we are able to see. We heard in chapter 53 previously what the uh, suffering servant would be going through. That his suffering on the cross was to bring restoration to his people and an invitation to the Gentiles. We heard from Stephen last week about the peoples coming back from Babylon, from exile to Israel. That they were living in the now and the not yet, just as we are doing. We have the Holy Spirit within us through Christ, but we are not yet living in glory. We are still living in hope, still waiting on God. Now, before Babylon came, Judah and Jerusalem were filled with idols. The people of Israel had no fear of God. They feared new gods more. The spirit of the lowly was sometimes lifeless with the prevalent sin and idolatry that was around them. They were being crushed by the worshipping of idols. 
publicly and privately being devoted to idols and the immorality that went with it. Described as having committed adultery and the offspring of prostitutes, having climbed into bed with these detestable gods. Now, these are the words we read in verses 3 down to 11. Now, we read verse 13, another complete contrast. The first part of verse 13, what can your idols do when you cry out to them for help? What use are they to you when you are in need? They are so helpless, a breath of wind can knock them down. And then here comes the contrast. Very small word, three letters, but as is the case in the Bible many times, so, so important. But whoever trusts in me will possess the land and inherit my holy mountain. I will say, rebuild the road, clear the rocks, stones or obstacles, so my people can return from captivity. So, build up my people, comfort my people. Now, this is viewed by some commentators as the Jews returning to their own land, Israel, by others as an imagery of a road on which the contrite, the humble, the repentant can return to God through Christ. Admitting their own lack of ability to achieve holiness and righteousness for themselves. Those whose only refuge is in Jesus Christ and who have put their trust and confidence in him, rejecting idolatry, shall worship, shall partake in the communion of the true Church of Christ. God has a word of encouragement for the faithful remnant here, the lowly, the humble, the meek, the contrite. He will be with them. Verse 15 in the NIV says, here the, the focus is on God to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. His merciful purpose is to call his people back to himself in a love relationship because he loves his people. Now, how is he going to revive? By giving hope. Hope of a way back. Hope through the Messiah to come because of his persistent grace. For thus says the high and lofty one, one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones from the New King James Version. So what does contrite mean? Feeling regret, sorrow for one's sins, penitent, an example of contrite is the feeling of someone who feels terribly about committing sin. And what does lowly in spirit mean? A lack of vanity, of self-importance, humbleness, humility, meekness, and modesty. So go back here to the high and lofty one. God's people were being reminded as to who was speaking. They had lost sight of the majesty of God, his holiness, his glory, high above the earth and nations, higher than kings and rulers of this world, and so able to save his people and destroy their and his enemies, whose thoughts are higher than their thoughts, whose love is so vast and never ending who inhabits eternity, is from everlasting to everlasting, without beginning or end, whose name is holy. So do we forget the majesty and the holiness of the one who speaks? I think sadly that we do. And in too many churches today, 
That is very much the case. God is brought down to nothing more than a friend and is belittled. But he also dwells, we read, with the contrite and the lowly in spirit. The Messiah coming to live amongst man and woman, living within those who are contrite and repentant by the Holy Spirit. A question was asked, how big is God? And the answer was given. He's big enough to rule his mighty universe, yet small enough to live in my heart. If humans are to be healed of their sinful behaviour, there needs to be repentant hearts. It must be God who does this. And he will do this for those who live in humble reliance on him. Now, the language here in verse 15 is significant, reminding us of the language in John 15, 5. Jesus said, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 16 tonight, I will fight against, I will not fight against you forever. I will not always show my anger. If I did, all people would pass away. All souls I have made. Now, who's made all the souls? It's Jesus Christ, isn't it? Jesus did. Jesus existed before time. Before anything was made, he just was. John 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 2. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. The New Living Translation. John 1, 3 going on. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made that has been made. And Jude 25. To the only God. Our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Verse 17. I was enraged by a sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on his willful ways, NIV. Kept on sinning, kept on backsliding. God was enraged by Israel's sinful greed and repeatedly punished them for it. But they would not change their ways. They carried on willfully sinning. They would not submit. Does that sound familiar? Verse 18. Heal them. I have seen what they do but I will heal them anyway, New Living Translation. The contrite, the humble, will have the blessing of spiritual healing. Where is the fulfilment of the healing going to come from? Who is the only one qualified to heal? There is only one. The one who was there before time. The one who created all things, as we've just read. It could only be Jesus Christ. Matthew 20 verse 28. For even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. The one who said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only one who can restore our broken relationship with God the Father. 
Romans 6 23 for the wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and the one whose death and resurrection would defeat sin and death Charles Spurgeon comments it is the sole prerogative of God to remove spiritual disease. On this account, the psalmist cried unto the Lord, He who made man can restore man. He who was at first the creator of our nature can new create it. What a transcendent comfort it is that in the person of Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily my soul whatever thy disease may be this great physician can heal thee this great physician can heal thee god is a just god and a just god has to be righteous and fair which includes administering justice and punishment israel had to face punishment because of sin we had to face justice and punishment as we continued in our willful ways of sinning worshiping serving idols and not humbly coming before the lord let's go further into isaiah isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 behold the lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sins cut us off from God. How can the Holy One of Israel, a just and righteous God, forgive our sins and remember them no more and yet still bring judgment and punishment? Acts 10 verse 43 he is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name, referring to Jesus Christ. For us to be revived and healed, the punishment for sin, all sin, our sin, was put upon Jesus Christ on the cross where the father turned his face away from his son. Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross to take the punishment, our punishment. Matthew 26, sorry, Matthew 27, verse 46, at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your face from me? Why have you abandoned me? The one and only time that God the Father did this to his Son. Because the Holy One could not abide sin. He could not bear to look at his Son who was carrying the sin of all. Because of Jesus' death, the death of a righteous servant we can now be counted righteous. Verse 19 says, peace, peace. Only Jesus can give this peace because of his death on the cross, because he was slain like a lamb, our sacrifice on the cross. Because of this, he gives us peace with God, the only one who could and can. And we continue to read there, both near, referring to the Jews, and far, referring to the Gentiles. For I will heal them all, says the Lord. God's vast plan of salvation for the whole world, not just Judah, was that Jews and Gentiles will be healed. Will have deliverance and restoration with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is not directly mentioned here in Isaiah 57, but he is the one who brings 
the fulfillment of this prophecy. There is a warning in verses 20 and 21. But those who still reject me are like the restless sea. It is never still, but continually churns up mire and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked, says God. We have a picture here, don't we? It brings up filth, dirt, mire, muck from the very bottom, the depths of the sea, and brings it up to the surface where there is a beauty of crystal clear water. It just comes up and blurs that, muddies it, ruins it. The wicked may have the semblance of peace or a false peace, but nothing which is worthy of calling it actual peace. Just note another contrast here between verses 20 and 21 and verse 19 that we've just seen, but also with verse 2 of chapter 57. Verse 2 of chapter 57 says, Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. Another complete contrast to verses 20 and 21. Man-made religion can never produce peace. Peace only comes from sovereign grace, from a holy God. We are incapable of living righteous lives if we are looking on our own ability to do so. Do we get that this evening? We are incapable of living sinless lives in our strength and in our understanding. Deliverance is a work of God's grace alone, by means of God's persistent grace, not because of who we are, but because of what Jesus has done, because of his suffering. As Christians, do our lives, does our behaviour show the behaviour of Christ, his attitudes, his passions, this is true faith, not just saying yes to Jesus. John Piper said in one of his sermons, Christ's death is why God can acquit a guilty people without dropping charges. Everything hoped for in this great passage comes to us, even to us Gentiles, in Jesus Christ. We can read it as a personal offer of hope to any of us who, are, who will accept the healing of humbling and the cure of a crushed spirit. If you are watching and listening tonight and you have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never trusted in him as your Lord and your personal saviour, if you've never gone and fallen on your knees and asked for forgiveness for the wrongs that you have done in this life, can I please implore you to do so right now? Fall before him with a contrite and a humble heart. Right where you are, right now. Please, now, not tomorrow, don't wait. Call on the name of Jesus Christ and he will hear you. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10 verse 13. Let's pray. Oh Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Lord, the Holy and Lofty One, help us to remember this. Lord, help us to remember your majesty. Help us to remember your holiness. Help us, Lord, to not turn to other things, to idols, Lord. Help us when we're in need to turn to you first, to come to you. Lord, help us to worship you to praise you. 
Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you that this prophecy was fulfilled. That there is an ability, there is a way to revive and to be healed. There is a way back to you if we come to you with contrite, humble and repentant hearts. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that way back. And Lord, I ask that you please help us to remember, to remember these things over these coming days now for this week, this week ahead. Help us, Lord, to show the love of Christ to whoever we come into contact with this week. Help us, Lord, to be great witnesses for you this week. Please use us, we pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Lord, we bring all of this to you now. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who was there before time, the one who created all things. The one who can revive and can heal. In his name we pray. For his glory we ask. Amen.